Good morning. Thank you for joining us online today, and thank you for um, just worshiping with us. So if you are at home, um, <clears throat> you are more than welcome to stand up and praise, with, with, praise and sing God with us, or you can sit on your couch, whatever you feel led to do. So please join us as we worship this morning. We stand and lift up our hands, for the joy of the Lord is our strength. We bow down and worship Him now, how great, how awesome is He, and together we see.
During the uh, Jewish Passover and before Christ was uh, betrayed, he was joined by his disciples for a final meal. As Christians, we note that as the Last Supper. Today, on this first day of the week, we come to the table. 
and we follow the commandments of Jesus where he tells us that we are to break this bread and to give thanks to him. The body, this is the body I'm well and for you, take and eat. Following the, following the meal and after the supper as a separate item, he took the fruit of the vine and said, this is the covenant of my blood. Do this in remembrance of me poured out for you. Father, he said, whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let me repeat that. That's, that's why we're here. That's why we do this. Father, he said, whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we pray that you'll be with us. Help us that we will put away all worldly thoughts, all things of this current world, that life that we have today. We ask you to be with us, to give us the strength, give us the guidance, and help us to remember that as we partake of this cup, of this bread and this cup, that we're doing this to be ever mindful of what you have provided to us, which is a home in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Why is it that some people make it and others don't? Two athletes of equal physical ability can accept, each accept a scholarship to play football at the local university. One enjoys a great career, while the other just flounders and eventually drops out. 
or two entrepreneurs with equal assets. One develops a business that makes millions of dollars while the other goes bankrupt. Why is that? Is it all just luck? We've all seen two couples from similar cultural and spiritual backgrounds. 30 years later, one couple is happily married and enjoying their grandchildren, while the other couple is broken up. They're barely speaking to each other. Why is that? Well, there are a lot of contributing factors that determine what happens in people's lives, but one important ingredient is persistence. The people who really achieve just stay with it longer. They don't quit easily. They're not easily intimidated by obstacles. They often see obstacles as opportunities. Over the course of time, they gain confidence. Bouncing back from failure makes them less fearful and more self-assured. It used to be that the primary measurement for potential was one's IQ, their intelligence quotient. We now know that intelligence is not the most important measurement of a person's potential. There are all kinds of examples of people with high IQs who have failed. I'm sure we could find several of those in Washington, D.C. and in Richmond. But perhaps more important than IQ would be AQ, adversity quotient. Successful people have this one thing in common. They refuse to quit. They persevere. While there's not much that one can do to improve their IQ, you can significantly improve your AQ. The Apostle Paul wrote about persistence in the fourth chapter of 2 Corinthians. And in this section that we're covering this morning, Paul discusses the importance of perseverance in the Christian life. Our theme phrase for today comes from verse 16, where Paul writes, Therefore, we do not lose heart. It's likely that someone watching or listening today is struggling in an area of your life, and you're losing heart, and you're about to give up. Many of us have friends who really struggle, and they look to you for encouragement. So please pay careful attention as we read through this section verse by verse. I want you to see four familiar encouragements that should enhance our endurance and confidence during uncertain times. Motivational speakers would really love this passage because it speaks about positive attitudes, turning obstacles into opportunities. The first encouragement is found in verses 8 and 9. Paul writes, we are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. The Living Bible paraphrases verse nine, we get knocked down, but we get back up again. We get going. So the first encouragement is get back up when you get knocked down. The Apostle Paul was amazingly resilient. He bounced back from a lot of hard knocks in his ministry. Threaten him in Jerusalem and he flees into an Arabian desert where he spends a decade preparing and studying in obscurity. Then he resurfaces in Antioch, ready to do ministry. Or stone him and leave him for dead outside of Lystra. And the next day he goes into Derby and wins a large number of disciples. Throw him into prison in Philippi and he converts the jailer. Drag him into the courtroom in Caesarea and he turns the witness stand into a pulpit. Shipwreck him, strain him on the island of Malta, and he wins the island's chief politician to the Lord. Throw him into a Roman jail, and he emerges several months later with a good portion of our New Testament in his hands. Paul got back up every time he got knocked down. There was a high school senior who applied to three colleges, only to be rejected by all three. When a fourth rejected him, he wrote to the admissions office, Dear sir, I am in recipient... I am in receipt of your rejection, and frankly, sir, that is over my limit. So I am rejecting your rejection and, re and will report for class on September 18th. Now, I don't know how that turned out, but I guarantee you that history is full of examples of people like the Apostle Paul or Abraham Lincoln or Thomas Jefferson who succeeded because they rejected the rejection. They kept getting back up when they got knocked down. Theodore Roosevelt was rejected when he tried to enlist in the army for the Spanish-American War. They told him he was too old and he was too nearsighted. So Roosevelt rejected the rejection, went out and organized a civilian militia, which he christened the Rough Riders. He went to Cuba and led followers in the famous charge up San Juan Hill. The rest of President Teddy Roosevelt's story is history. 
Charles Goodyear of Goodyear Tire was penniless in 1838 when he discovered the method of vulcanizing rubber. At that time, his invention was still to be perfected. His creditors were hounding him, and he filed for bankruptcy. He was in prison for contempt of court. Behind prison bars, undistracted, Goodyear perfected the rubber process. He turned the obstacle in, into an opportunity. He not only paid off his creditors, but he made, fame, he made fortunes for all those who kept faith in him. When Albert Einstein was a graduate student, his doctoral dissertation was rejected as being too fanciful and irrelevant. Fortunately, he rejected the rejection and didn't throw the theory of relativity into the trash can. It's imperative the Christian people in these days develop that same attitude of persistence. Proverbs 24, 16 reads, For though the righteous fall seven times, they rise again, but the wicked stumble when calamity strikes. As it becomes increasingly unpopular in our world to be an evangelical Christian, we are going to get knocked down by ridicule and rejection again and again. So it's important that we have this resiliency to bounce back up. Some of you today have stumbled and fallen big time in the Christian life. Maybe you've slipped back into old habits. Or you failed at marriage or parenthood or church leadership. You're tempted to throw in the towel and wallow in self-pity and quit. Get back up and go on to do the things that God has in store for you that he's called you to. Think about the Christian people who've turned obstacles into opportunities simply because they were tenacious. Johnny Erickson Tata was paralyzed from the neck down in a swimming accident before age 20. Yet the testimony she has through her writing and her music and verbal witness has been an incredible opportunity for good. Dave Ramsey, the well-known Christian financial counselor, was bankrupt midway through his life. Now he leads Financial Peace University seminars all over the country. Sherry Rose Shepherd was entered in a beauty pageant, and she walked off the end of the runway. She fell face down in front of the judge's table. She got up, brushed herself off, and said, I just wanted to make sure you remembered me. They did, and she won. Later, she became Miss USA and wrote about that incident in her book, Life is Not a Dress Rehearsal. They and countless others were struck down, but not destroyed. It's interesting how we use that word, but. We commonly use it to introduce a negative thought. Sure is a nice day, but it'll probably rain again tomorrow. I like the music, but it is kind of loud. I believe in God, but I just can't understand why he let that happen. The writers of the New Testament use that word often to introduce a positive reality. The church was persecuted, but those who were scattered went about preaching the word. James was beheaded, but the word of God increased. Peter was in prison, but the church was earnestly pay praying for him. In this world you will have trouble, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And then Paul writes, we are hard-pressed, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. Therefore, we don't lose heart. The second encouragement is found in verses 10 through 12. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that his life may also be revealed in our mortal body. So then death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. A persistent Christian loves the Lord more than life itself. Our physical sufferings remind us that Jesus suffered and died for us. And our reaction to those sufferings, those obstacles, is an opportunity to give testimony to Christ. The Apostle Paul considered himself expendable so that others would come to know Jesus Christ. That's why he could persevere. There are numerous examples of that, but I'll give you just one this morning. In Acts chapter 19, we read that Paul went into the city of Ephesus and he conducted such a revival meeting, so many people turned to Christ 
that the souvenir idol makers were threatened by Christianity. So those who made these idols stirred up the people against Christianity and started a riot in the city. The Bible says they rushed into the theater together and for two hours they chanted for the blood of the Christians. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Many of them didn't even know why they were there. They just wanted to see somebody suffer. And it says, in, and it says that Paul wanted to appear before the crowd, but the disciples would not let him. Now, at first, that doesn't make sense to me. I picture something like the movie theater at the mall or at the Alamo Theater. Why would Paul want to go in there? He would be trapped. But pictures of the remains of ancient Ephesus show a, hu show a huge outdoor amphitheater cut like a horseshoe into the mountain at the edge of town. It seated 25,000 people. And when you would walk out onto the main street, you could look right into the open end of that arena. That's the theater that people ran into, perhaps 25,000 strong, shouting for the blood of the Christians. Paul steps out onto the main street and sees all those people, and what's his reaction? Wow, what an opportunity to preach! And verse 31 says, Even some of the officials of the province, friends of Paul, sent him a message begging him not to venture into the theater. But you see, Paul was willing to face that hostile crowd or go through a shipwreck or beatings or imprisonment because he loved the Lord more than his own life. If he could just convince one more person that Jesus was the Messiah, it would be worth whatever the cost. And he never quit. Now let me ask you, does Jesus Christ matter more to you than life itself? That's what he asks. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will save it. Do you love the Lord so much that you would be willing to give your life to advance his cause? If our government reported a terrorist threat against churches in America, would you show up next week? Would you say, I'm willing to die for my testimony in Jesus Christ? Now, most of us aren't called upon to be martyrs. But I guess maybe the more relevant question is, is your devotion to Christ greater than any other single thing in life? Do you love the Lord more than romantic relationships? Some of you who are single are in a relationship that you know is outside the will of God. Are you willing to terminate that relationship because of your devotion to Jesus Christ? Do you love the Lord more than the comforts of the United States of America? If God led you overseas to help translate the Bible into another language, or work in children's homes and tribal areas, would you go with me next year to India and possibly stay? Do you love the Lord more than the possessions and pleasures of this life? Do you put the church ahead of ball games, golf, picnics, fishing trips? Is the Lord really an all-consuming passion for you? Or is he just a weekend convenience? Jesus said, whoever can be trusted with very little can be trusted with much. If we're really going to persevere in the Christian life, our allegiance to Jesus Christ must supersede everything else, including our own life. Andy Dillard wrote, how we spend our days is how we spend our lives. And if we love the Lord more than life itself, we will not lose heart. Verses 13 through 15 reveal an additional encouragement to, persever to persistence. It is written, I believed, therefore I have spoken. Since we have that same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak. Because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you to himself. All this is for your benefit so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. The third encouragement is that you believe what you say you believe. Paul says, all this that I'm doing is for your benefit because I believe that if you come to Christ, 
you can be saved too. That belief kept Paul going. That belief keeps a lot of people going today. A school teacher may say at the, at the end of the year, that's it, I've had it. I'm not coming back next year. But during the summer, that teacher thinks those students need the testimony and the information I can give to them. I think I'll go back for their sake. Or a wife may say, I've had it with my husband, his neglect, his indifference. I'm going to live life for myself. But then in calmer moments, she thinks about her children, about her family, about her husband, about her God. And she decides to stick it through. A businessman can say, my competitors cheat and they make a profit. I might as well give up on standing for principles and do the same thing. But then he remembers the testimony for other people and the family. And he decides to do the right thing regardless. Christians need to know what they believe and why. Down deep in their core. One of my concerns as a pastor is that people come to church or watch online in order to just feel good. Some churches and pastors become very large and popular because they always preach positive, feel-good messages. But if that's all there is, you're going to fade when the pressure is on. Christianity begins with certain facts that we believe. Then there's faith that is acted out. Then comes the feeling that we enjoy. But it must be in that order. In July of 2007, my mom passed away from ovarian cancer. She'd been diagnosed about a year prior to that, and after having surgery and chemo treatments, she was doing well. But not long after that, she started feeling bad again. Tests in the hospital showed that the cancer had returned. Lying in the hospital bed that night, she was as mad as I had ever seen her, and I'd seen her pretty, ba- pretty mad in my time. Entering her room the next day was like a different woman had come into that room. She said, God and I had a long talk last night, and he caused me to realize I can't lose. If I stay here, I get to see my grandkids grow up. If he calls me home, well, that's what I've been living my whole life for. She believed what she said she believed. Do you really believe what you say you believe? Do you believe it strongly enough that you'll persevere when life seems to be unraveling? You see, it's one thing to say, I believe in Jesus when life is going smoothly. But it's a little tougher to say, I believe in Jesus when you're only 63 years old with five grandchildren and dying of cancer. Or when is something that happened to my cousin and her husband, your twins are born several months premature and one dies shortly after delivery. They both continue to serve and praise the Lord faithfully knowing one day that they'll be reunited with Luke for eternity. Job lost everything he had. Ten children who all died on the same day. He lost his health. His wife ridiculed his faith. And Job didn't understand why God was seemingly so unjust. But in the middle of all that pressure, Job said, though he slay me, yet will I hope in him. Do you believe it that strongly? When life gets uncertain, you better know what you believe and why you believe it. Because when you come to church, the music just seems shallow. The sermon rings hollow. People seem so much on the surface. But you better be able to say, though he slay me, I will still trust in him. I believe that Jesus is the Christ. I still believe the Bible is true. I still believe that God is good and just, and he will work all things together for good. He's going to make everything right someday. I believe, so I'll not lose heart. One other thing from verses 16 through 18. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we're wasting away, yet inwardly we're being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. 
Persistent Christians keep their eyes on the goal. The reason Paul could keep going was because he had his eyes fixed on his eternal goal. Granted, Paul had an advantage that you and I don't have. He had the unique opportunity to see heaven. In 2 Corinthians 12, it says that Paul was called up into the third heaven and he was permitted to see things that are inexpressible and to see things he was not permitted to tell. But he did say this, to depart and be with the Lord is better by far than remaining here. So Paul says to fix your eyes on that eternal goal because everything you see, including your own body, is temporary. It's going to pass away. The only things that will last are the things that you can't see. The spirit of life inside the body. Eternal life in heaven. So fix your eyes on the unseen. Keep your eyes on the eternal goal. What happens when a basketball player steps up to the free throw line in a big game? Everyone seated behind the backboard, screaming, waving their arms, doing everything that they can to distract him. So the player really needs to concentrate in order to make the shots. He has to fix his eyes on the rim. Our purpose is to go to heaven when we die and take as many people as we can with us. And our adversary, Satan, is going to do everything he can to distract us from focusing on that goal. He'll talk you into losing heart because of your own physical problems. Paul says outwardly we're wasting away. Boy, isn't that the truth? We don't like to admit it, but strange things happen to our bodies as we get older. Wrinkles and pain. We lose flexibility. We lose firmness. Hair grows in places it shouldn't, and it quits growing where it should. Eyes grow dim, and our memories fade. Sometimes you don't notice, but other people do, and they don't mind pointing it out to you. And we try to camouflage it with hair transplants, makeup, loose-fitting clothes, even surgery. But it's only distracting. Those things are happening, and it's discouraging, and it can make you lose your confidence. But Paul says to keep your eye on the goal. One day you'll have a new body. There'll be no more death, no more aging, no more warts, no more pains. Outwardly, we're wasting away. But inwardly, we're being renewed day by day. Satan will attempt to divert your attention away with your own personal problems. Family stress, business demands, financial pressure. And you can throw up your hands and say, I just can't take it anymore. But keep your eye on the goal. The message paraphrases verse 16. These hard times are small potatoes compared to the coming good times. The lavish celebration prepared for us. Paul says when we get to heaven 10,000 years from now, we'll look back. And the problems that seem so huge right now are going to seem so minuscule and so momentary compared with that lavish celebration that we will have. So keep focused on that ultimate goal. Fix your eyes on what is unseen. When we keep coming back to that, it helps keep our perspective and we can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. Your life is not always going to be the way you hoped. But remember... This world is not your home. You're just passing through. The difficulties that we've faced in the past several weeks and those that will continue will be minuscule and momentary when compared to the glory of eternity. So be persistent. Our obstacles really are opportunities. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we're so thankful this morning for your promises of your word. The encouragement that we have, knowing that our obstacles really are just opportunities to serve you and to be a witness for you. Lord, our response to those obstacles is really, really important in our Christian walk. When obstacles come in front of us and we conduct ourselves in a way that's pleasing to you and there's a sense of peace and calmness around us, what an opportunity we have to share the reason for our hope to share the reason for our calmness and the sense of peace that we have, knowing that it all comes from you. Lord, let us take advantage of every opportunity that we have to share the gospel with someone in our lives this week, whether someone we know or someone we don't know. 
Let's reach out to them with the promise and the hope that you give to each one of us every day. Lord, we just thank you and praise you in all things. In Jesus' name, amen. this morning. We do hope that your time with us has been a blessing. Our thought for the week is, storms without God will break you. Storms with God will build you. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this time that we could spend together with you. We thank you for your word. Lord, we are going through some trying times right now, but may we each be like Paul and get up. Things will be better, and a new day is in the future. We do know, Lord, that there are many that are suffering, and we do pray for those that are sick. We pray for those that are lonely And we just ask, Lord, that they would feel your love and your strength. We ask now, Lord, that you would go before us, that you would bless us and be with us. And may each of us share your love with all that we come in contact with. We thank you, Lord, and we pray these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.